is at Tufts Medical Center, and it will have a hand therapist input from uh, Joey Pipicelli, who is in Ontario, Canada. Uh, as far as uh, conflicts of interest, uh, none of us have any significant conflicts, and they uh, uh, are presented uh, on this slide, whoever has one. Uh, North America is an independent, North American uh, AO, North America is an independent nonprofit surgical specialty society dedicated to improving the care of the musculoskeletal injuries. Does not endorse or promote any uh, specific product or brand or commercial entity. The equipments that you may be seeing in, the, uh, in this course on the demonstrations are only for demonstration purposes only and uh, they're not intended to advertise any specific brand. Uh, for obtaining CME, uh, North America, um, AU North America, sorry, uh, is accredited for, as part of the Accredited Council of Medical Education to provide continuing medical education. AO North America designates a live internet activity for a maximum of 11 and quarter AMA uh, category one credit. Physicians should claim, of course, only the uh, credit that they attended to. To receive the CME credit, a link will be provided 24 hours after the conclusion of the, the whole series to, be, uh, to have an evaluation. And upon completion of that, we'll have the access to the claim to uh, CME certificate. Now, just to go over the Zoom etiquettes, um, all microphones will be uh, turned off. All video cameras will be off. If you have any questions, please use the question and answer box in the Zoom uh, lower bar. Uh, the, moder the moderators will uh, review the questions and answer them as they come, or will uh, present it to the speaker to to present it uh, towards the end of the uh, session during the question answer section. And the use of the chat box is only for the uh, faculty and staff. So let's go over the agenda. Uh, I will be uh, uh, presenting some introductory remark about evaluation and management and a case uh, to be followed with Dr. Capo, who will uh, present how to uh, is done, more of a detail in the techniques of doing it and lessons that he learned, uh, perhaps possible some complications that may be coming up. Uh, Dr. Cassidy will also present another case as our faculty navigating some possible uh, minefield in the area, maybe uh, possible complications to prevent. And then uh, we'll have a discussion on therapy uh, and uh, some time for uh, case discussions and then closing remarks. The learning objective is to uh, I understand, identify the radiological um, indications for surgical procedures, uh, define the appropriate surgical anatomy for this uh, condition, identify the clinical criteria requiring surgery or indications for the surgery, uh, recognize possible pitfalls, and having the pertinent literature uh, in, in mind. So just as far as, as, as by way of advertisement, uh, this is our the, uh, case series that we have been doing. Today, we're doing the terrible triad injuries um, with the SAGE uh, of Dr. Cabo. We'll have May 16, May, uh, September 19, we'll have more cases. Uh, the next topics, as you see, distal ulna fracture, fracture of the base of the thumb, nerve injuries, distal humerus fractures, and uh, compression neuropathies, uh, uh, and the uh, online series for the for the year. Uh, the, we also have uh, other webinars. Uh, in, in May 1st, we'll have a finger flaps webinar, uh, both bone forearm fractures, and December 4th, we'll have the distal radius uh, malunion. Um, upcoming actual hand courses, there are uh, these following four courses. You see the uh, hand fellows course and add a plug-in for them. On uh, May 31st, we'll have that. Uh, it's an actual uh, online, not, not an online in-person. In May 31st to June 2nd in San Diego, we'll have a hand and a wrist fractures uh, course uh, in August 3rd in Irvine, California, that I'll be uh, chairing. There's a hand fracture management coming up in Jersey City in October 26th, and another upper extremity uh, course with a collaborative based study in November of this year. 
in Cincinnati. Uh, just to have uh, at this uh, presentation will be recorded. Uh, to have an access to recording, you can check on YouTube under AOHAN North America. We also on Ortho TV on OrthoTVOnline.com. Okay, so let's go into the terrible triad of the uh, the three fire set carriers of today. So in history, in terms of history, the term. A terrible triad was initially coined by Hotchkiss in 1996, basically presenting the three simultaneous injuries that happen uh, with a elbow dislocation, uh, at the same time having a coronary fracture and having a radial head fracture. Uh, the three injuries together uh, cause problem and uh, it's a second common uh, joint to dislocate, the elbow. 20% uh, of the elbow fractures will have some uh, associated fractures. The soft tissues that were injured um, involved the anterior capsule, lateral ulnar collateral ligament, and possible sometimes the medial collateral ligament. There's a radial head fracture, which is significant stabilizer of the elbow. It resists the posterior dislocation of the elbow. If you have 20 to 30 percent of the time, the elbow dislocation includes a radial head fracture or either neck or the head. The capsular joint uh, is the most uh, force is is transmitted during the zero to thirty degrees of flexion of the forearm. So most of these injuries are about almost the last uh, few degrees of extension. Now these fractures in involve coronoid fracture. Coronoid process acts as a bony buttress to prevent posterior dislocation of the elbow. Uh, there are soft tissue insures, insertions on this coronoid, important. There are the anterior capsule, the brachialis muscle, and the medial collateral ligament, as you see on the picture here. Now, O'Driscoll and Mori described this concept of circular pori, which is uh, uh, there's a predictable way of dislocation and predictable set of injuries that happen when elbow dislocates. The first is the lateral ulnar collateral ligament that gets disrupted. Then it's the radial head impact of the capitalum that may, can lead to a fracture. Then the posterior lateral elbow dislocation happens with a collision of the anterior part of the trochlea hitting against the uh, coronate process, causing a coronate fracture. Sometimes the medial collateral ligament can be injured or sometimes it's not. So. Medial collateral injury is not a necessary part of the uh, terrible triad. So the outcomes, historically outcomes have been poor. That's why it's called a terrible or poor uh, long-term uh, outcomes uh, and persistent instability with secondary stiffness and arthritis. So that's why it's set certain surgical protocols have been significantly uh, developed so that to improve the process and uh, over the recent uh, decades, the process has been improved and less of a, uh, a long-term problem uh, residual happens after the terrible triad. Uh, surgery is almost always indicated to obtain a stable joint and allow early range of motion. Open reduction internal fixation of the coronoid or repair of the anterior capsule in Morton, repair of the repla or replace of the radial head, uh, repair of lateral ulnar collateral ligament complex and the medial collateral ligament if injured is important. And sometimes uh, all of above uh, is not enough and re may require additional fix uh, stability fixation like an external or internal fixation. Now, as far as surgical approach goes, uh, most of the time uh, the approach is for this injury is lateral. There are three different ways to approach it. Uh, the coker, Kaplan or the Boyd intervals. Uh, basically, there are some uh, split of the extensor tendon origin and uh, opening of the uh, joint allows to repair of the involved radial head and coronoid and the collateral ligaments. Sometimes if you need to go, you may have to go immediately. Uh, I think our, our faculty will discuss that. Fracture of the coronoid can be fixed either uh, with a suture Transosseous suture, or bony anchors, or screws, or even plates if needed, especially on the medial side, as you see on the picture here. Fixation of the uh, radial head sometimes is possible, and it can be done with plate or screws, as we see in these pictures, headless screws or plates. 
or sometimes require a replacement, especially it's more than three or four parts and is uh, completely dusted. Now, obviously, ligament repair is important uh, as part of these uh, steps of uh, terrible triad uh, repair. Lateral ulnar carotid ligament, as you see on the picture, is a major part of the stability, especially for the lateral side of the elbow, uh, which kind of includes the uh, collateral uh, annular ligament. Sorry. So this can be repaired with an anchor or transosseous sutures, and sometimes medial collateral ligament can be repaired if needed. In all else fails, there's also an additional joint fixer that can be used internally or sometimes externally. Here's the case I'm going to present. It's a 32-year-old uh, laborer who uh, fell uh, uh, with her on the right hand and with an elbow dislocation. He was reduced in the emergency room outside and came to my clinic. Um, as you see in the picture, uh, on the lower left, you see the coronoid fracture anteriorly. There's a piece uh, in that looks like a radial head fragment, way displaced distally. And uh, we got a CT scan. It's common to get a CT scan for this fracture, so to, to see where the pieces are and where do they belong. Um, and he went through the standard uh, uh, sets of treatment, as we described. The plan or treatment was stabilize the elbow to allow early range of motion, to fix or replace the radial head, fix the coronoid, and or anterior, st somehow stabilize the anterior part of the elbow and repair the lateral ulnar ligament. So this was done through a lateral incision. Uh, this was a coker type incision. Um, by elevating the, some of the anterior musculature, we can, uh, and especially the fracture of the radial head allows visualization of the coronoid and you can use an, a guide like an ACL guide to uh, make drill holes and put sutures through the anterior capsule and maybe part of the brachialis and bring down the uh, evolved coronoid and to tie over a bony bridge or some kind of a uh, other anchoring system. That was done in this patient. And then patient was seen post-op. Uh, he did develop a little uh, heterotopic ossification of the radial head, but the radial head uh, was able to be fixed with a, a three uh, headless screws. As you can see in the middle picture, there are two small holes uh, where the uh, drill holes were made to bring down the uh, coronoid. And it was very stable, a lot early range of motion. And he obviously looked like he had some kind of an injury in the medial sides as some calcification or heterotopic calcification is being built there. We uh, repaired the lateral color, ulnar collateral ligament with an anchor, as you see. So postoperatively, he was put in a long arm splint for the first 10 days till the wound was healed. And then we started uh, uh, range of motion. Um, as our therapist will discuss, we started with a pronated um, uh, supine elbow extension. This way, active extension can be started uh, without any jeopardizing the uh, collateral ligament repair. And then uh, we transitioned to an elbow range of motion brace. And then now uh, he was uh, seen after six months, he will still continue to improve and has significant improved range of motion. And his range of motion, eight months post-op, uh, decent, about 50, 15 to 140 uh, range of motion. Supination is somewhat limited because of probably heterotopic ossification around the radial neck, but no pain, he's uh, back to work, but he's still using the status progressive brace system to get better extension and flexion. The average outcome in the literature is uh, is about 112 degrees of uh, flexion arc of motion and forearm ro rotation of 136. With more attention to detail, uh, hopefully we'll be uh, able to do a little bit better motion. Take home message is terrible triad is a complex injury. Particular attention needs to be paid to the repairing of the each injured component, coronary, radial head, and collateral ligaments. And postoperative rehabilitation is important to be adaptive to the patient's progress. Uh, and some residual limited uh, range of motion is expected. Uh, we will continue with Dr. Cabo uh, with uh, four of more specific how to do the techniques and perhaps how to challenge uh, the uh, complications and deal with them. And uh, further treatment will be discussed. I'm going to uh, stop my sharing. 
Thanks, Emil. Thanks. That was awesome. All right. You guys good? You, you can yep. see my stuff, so to speak? <clears throat> Great. Yeah, it's amazing. This, you know, this thing is, you know, this entity has been around for a while, and the, and the concepts change not much, you know, but we learned how to fix it. And it's amazing that Bob Hotch has coined this in 98. I forgot it was him, and it was that long ago. So, all right, I'm going to talk about um, some some techniques and a little bit of a different uh, different fracture. Okay, so the elbow joint, I just want to touch on briefly um, the anatomy. So, you know, the way I look at it is the, the humeral ulnar joint is the hinge joint, and you need that, you know, you need that joint um, uh, or, or you have nothing. If the humeral ulnar joint is not there, you have really nothing. So that has to be lined up. The radial capitellar joint is, you know, we used to think it was expendable. It's not, but if that's off a little bit, they can do all right. Um, and then don't forget about the proximal radial ulnar joint as well. You know, that matters. So that is, there's no impingement on that. Sorry. Uh, all right. So the anatomy of the, of, of the humerus and the elbow really matters, you know? So if you look at the front, that coronoid is critical, right? And, you know, first we thought the coronoid didn't matter when I was a junior resident. It didn't matter. Then we realized it mattered. Then we thought it was just a pyramid and just a tip. And we realized it's not. And, you know, Sean O'Driscoll and David Ring really looked at all the facets. And it's, you know, it's got the tip that matters. But this medial facet over here is really critical. So it's not just a, a pyramid. There's many facets to it. So these... In the middle, these fracture dislocations are kind of what we're talking about, but there's different variants. And when you when you look at this posterior montagia, that gives you some ideas about the fracture pattern as well. So I'm going to touch on that case. This is an old column theory, again, that, that Jesse and David Ring wrote in 98, just when Bob was coining it. <clears throat> and it's, you know, it's interesting, if you look back, they, they didn't even talk about the radial head in the columns. They talked about a posterior column where there's really not a posterior column. Like, you can take the electron tip off or a malunion and the, the elbow can be reduced because the elbow wants to pull everything back and all the force on the elbow are, are going posterior. The brachialis, the biceps want to reduce the elbow and push it, pull it po posterior. So the anterior structures are important. And they didn't even talk about the trochlear or the medial facet of the coronoid. So old concept and we've learned a lot. So this is the case I want to touch on. <clears throat> Interesting case. It's a triad kind of, you know, the ligaments were, uh, were injured, but this is a young kid fell off a skateboard and it's important to look at these fractures. So he's got a proximal ulna, but it's not a montasia. You know, it's more than that. He's got a radial head, and his coronoid really shows all the facets that can be problematic. So what do we need? Further studies? Sure, right? Why not? It's kind of like Emil said, let's get a CT scan. And, you know, this was a nice 3, 3D. I tried to get 3D. Some of them aren't great. But this really shows you, that you know, what's going on. So I don't know if you can see my arrow, but... Yeah, this, yeah, awesome. This medial facet is a problem, right? This is a big piece that matters. It's a big proximal ulnar olecranon piece, which is good, so we can grab that. But then this coronoid piece <clears throat> is important. And the coronoid piece, you know, the size matters. And even five millimeters is a big, big deal. This is more than that. And, you know, it's interesting. There's nothing attached to that. And some of those cartoons that Emil showed from, you know, the AO show the brachialis attached on it. It doesn't attach on the tip. Attached much farther distally, so you can fix it without messing with the brachialis. Now, looking in the posterior, your radial head's one big piece, which is, is is an easy one, but that coronoid, again, from the front is a problem. So, so what has to be fixed? Kind of everything. We learned that, you know, we have to fix the, the proximal ulna, the tip, if it's big enough, the facet, and you do it sequentially. You know, when is it unstable and when does it become stable and also the radial head so a lot of times you know we fix the proximal ulna we fix the radial head and then we see is it still unstable do we have to fix the coronoid and sometimes i have a radial head trial in there you know to see what the stability is so this is fluoro shots not for diagnosis but they are for diagnosis i don't know why they put them up there uh, when I copy them. But all right, so we look at this proximal ulna, and this is nice. This is a big piece. And when I look at this and say, I can key this into the shaft, I know I can build off of that and I can lag that in. Uh, big medial facet, right? And you can see how the humerus slides out 
and actually goes, the, the forum goes radial and the humerus goes ulnar because that facet is not holding it. And then this coronoid tip's a problem, right? So order of fixation, and it depends. If it's, um, if it's a big coronoid piece that you can lag to the distal fragment, you can do that, but that's difficult. So this was, this was kind of an easy, a straightforward one. What do you do first? Uh, and for me, the window to the elbow is through a big posterior incision. So big posterior incision, go to either side. You could do lateral and medial incisions, but if you're going to plate on the back of the ulna, you might as well go posterior. So, you know, use this as your read, get your length, and then build off of that. So clamps to hold it. And, you know, it's important when you put this proximal ulnar plate on, bend this plate down, right? You know, and, and again, when, you know, we started this, we would put it on the triceps. But then we realize, you know, bend it down. You can actually, uh, you know, split the triceps you have to and make that plate, you know, fit well. And this screw cluster here really matters. Don't put one or two screws. Get good fixation. And this is a nice screw up into the tip, near the tip of the electron. Good fixation here. Good fixation distally. <clears throat> so now I have my length, right? But the stuff in the middle is a problem, right? So what do we have to do? So first... Let's key in this medial facet. So I got a clamp on that. I have a clamp on that. And then, you know, this is how I start posterior incision, big flaps, find the ulnar nerve, get it out of the way. That's the ulnar nerve on the bottom right. Get it out of the way. And at the end, decide what you want to do with it. So plate, clamps. And now I have that medial facet back, right? I have that medial facet. And then you have to creep up on the medial side and put a plate, right? Because you don't want to just try to catch it with screws from the back. If it's a big piece, you might, but I have a screw from the top to hold it, a clamp, and then a small 2-4 plate with good fixation. But then you see in this picture, that tip is still a problem. You can actually see <coughs> the humerus is, is going a little, little posterior because that coronoid is not stabilizing it. And this looks okay, but the tip of the of the residual coronoid <coughs> is not much more than the electron. And you know, roughly the tip of the coronoid should be twice as high as the electron. So we're missing a decent amount, a good amount of coronoid. So I think if you can come up from the top, this is the medial exposure, the nerves in the front, work medial, and know where your MCL is so you don't take that down. And oftentimes your MCL is back here. Oftentimes that might be on the fragment. So you can put your plate on the top. <clears throat> but if you have a coronoid fragment, I think it's great if you can stabilize it rigidly with screws so if you can put screws from the top or if it's a big big piece from the bottom then you'd have fixation to stop that uh, posterior subluxation and to give you an anterior buttress suture anchors or if it's crumbly's help but it gives it a soft end point so if you can and it's hard and it's hard from the medial side but you can get screws across and good fixation and if you can catch the posterior cortex of the ulna that gives you that rigid fixation. Try to get two screws in there. Little screws, and they're always, they're, I'll show you on an AP later, they're always angled because you're coming from medial to lateral, but that, that's okay. So I think we're in good shape here. The coronoid is not perfect, but I think it's serving as a buttress. And now we look at the radial head. So do you, do you have to do anything with the radial head? I think so, right? You know, if, you know, at this point, it's actually lined up pretty well, but you're there, right? So, so technical point is don't go through the, I'll go back, don't go through the fracture. If you replace it, you can actually work through the fracture and replace it. But if, if you have to fix it, and especially now you're, you know, you're all closed up on the ulna, make a separate fascial incision. So make a separate fascial incision, come around. And I like a coker a little farther anterior or, or a caplet, I'm sorry. You know, the coker is actually right through the LCL. You got to watch it. You go front and back, but you do a caplet and go in the front. So radial head, you know, this is my my slides on. Don't forget the radial head, and it really matters, you know. And again, we used to think it was expendable, but it's not. So axial migration, we know that. You know, Essex Lopresti, everybody's afraid of that, but that's important. But it's this posterior dislocation, right? If you – now, I just fixed that little coronoid. If I take the radial head out or it's not fixed correctly, it won't stabilize that coronoid, and I'm going to put a lot of load on that coronoid. So the front of the coronoid, the anterior coronoid, and the radial head really stops stops the posterior migration and posterior subluxation. Valgus, it's a secondary stabilizer for valgus, but that's important. And then it's this this lateral column, this posterior lateral instability that's important. So the radial head is important. So I'm a big proponent of 
fix the radial head. You know, and the 17 year old kid, fix the radial head, you know, and if you can. So radial head, it, you know, it's just a radial head, but it's a little tricky. You know, this is a cadaver study we did because the radial head's not round. It's not at 90 degrees to the shaft. It's about 15 degrees. And if it's off, it's a little tricky because there's different articular facets. But a, a guide is the flat surface is on the is on the PRUJ and this lat, this angled surface is on the lateral side. So sometimes it's on the back table and you got to bring it back. Um, but I think if it's a young patient, you know, their native radial head really is the right thing for them. If you can't fix it and it's dusted and, you know, greater than three fragments, it becomes problematic. Sometimes you can. So sepulchral incision, a T-plate, and you'll see the plate is not is not really perpendicular to the shaft, but it's perpendicular to the radial head. But good fixation, and I want to make sure it's stable and extension. And it's there's a little sag here, but that's before I tighten the LCL. So uh, I think you know rigid fixation. Uh, we can move him early, and I avoid terminal extension. And Joey will talk about uh, therapy, but terminal extension. I know I'm going to load that coronoid. So flexion is great. Let them flex pronosupinate inflection and then depending on the ligaments avoid um you know pro, pro or, or pronation or supination based on the collateral ligament so plating goals fix the radial head little plates we used to think bigger plates little plates multiple screws in the head low profile pre-contoured or contour it yourself and i tell people when i plate the radial head especially and even you know, definitely electron i tell them they're going to have the plate out i said this plate's going to bug you you're going to take it out and about 50% of the time we take it out. And often uh, it bothers the patients, but more importantly, uh, they get a little contracture. So if you release around the radial head and take out the plate, usually you can get an improved um, uh, improved range of motion. And if you can, you know, it's nice to get your your um, your anchor right in the center of the um, of the uh, capitellum and the distal humerus like we have here. So the safe zone is critical, right? And Bob Hotchkiss, you know, wrote some great things. And, he, you know, he talks about pronation plus 50 or, and supination minus 50. But if you put the arm in neutral, and it's right, but it's confusing to me. If you put the arm in neutral, it's directly lateral is safe, plus or minus 50 degrees. That's the safe zone. But that being said, it can still impinge and cause problems. So, again, I tell people they're going to want that. They're going to want that out. So radial head replacement, I won't get into it too much. Uh, have it available. If you can't fix the radial head stably, and I say, you know, I usually give our, you know, give ourselves, all right, 30 minutes to fix the radio head because you got all the other work to do and you don't want the turn to get up too long and you can let it down. Um, but if it's not stable, you replace it, right? So now that being said, don't say we replace them all. So 17-year-old kids, spend your time and make it an, an effort to fix the radio head. And, and I've heard recently, you know, in some of our fracture conferences, some people say, look, I never fix the radial head, three parts, they never do well. I think that's wrong. You know, take your time. If you can fix it well, people's native radial head works better. Um, and, you know, Graham King has done a paper on everything with the elbow. But he looked at, you know, the biomechanical stability of the elbow and the native radial head is better because it's their normal head. And the head's not round. It's everybody's different. It's offset a little bit. Even the dish within the end of the radial head is not centered and so if you can fix your native radial head, it's good. So good overall result. Uh, and I moved him right away and not let him go, but avoid terminal extension. And uh, you know what happens? These They do well, but he he formed a lot of bone. He formed a lot of bone, but not too bad. And luckily, he didn't get a synostosis completely. If you have a synostosis up here, it's difficult to get, get to. So I will just touch on he had around the radial head. Uh, and his motion was reasonable, but his rotation wasn't great, right? <clears throat> so I just went back through the Kaplan, took out his plate, released everything. I took his proximal ulnar plate. And something's going on. You know, he's a, he's a nice fella, but he's a strange cat kind of. So something's going on weird down here. I did, in, in you know, inflammatory markers, infectious markers, nothing. And I took cultures. He didn't, you know, he didn't have an infection. Thank God. But, you know, from the Kaplan approach, you can get to this. And just as an aside, if you have a PRUJ synostosis, that's tricky. And the best way to get to it, I think, very hard to get to it from the front. Um, and Doug Handel taught me this, is you do a Pankovich approach, which is a strange approach. It's only written in Campbell's. And you take off the whole extensor mass 
uh, and the supinator right off the ulna, and then you come down in the posteriorous nerve is up here, and then you can get to that synostosis and take it down. So CT scan, HO, uh, not a, a, a frank synostosis, luckily, and that's what I did is go back through the Kaplan adjuvant therapy. I usually give them a blip or radiation, but he did well uh, and had a good good range of motion released. Took his plate out. He had some weird resorption here, but again, uh, he did not um, uh, he did not have an infection. So medial plate left on, radial head took out the hardware, released him, and he's got you know he's got an elbow with. Um, but with a good joint, and he should be fine. So I think if you do these predictably, they do well. So the results, and I think this is the paper that Emil mentioned, and I think this this is a great, again, Dave, uh, you know, Mike McKee, you know, Graham King. So on fixing this, so the key is fix or replace the radial head, fix the coronoid. And this is 2004. Before this, there's papers where they didn't fix the coronoid and they fell apart. Repair the, the LCL, and then you evaluate the MCL. If it's torn, swing over there and fix it. You know, if it's if it's loose, you can put an X fix on it. You can put a um, IJ internal joint stabilizer, IJS, um, uh, or fix it. Don't be afraid to fix it. And these people do okay, right? They do okay. So people say, "Well, my elbow be normal?" No, it's never going to be normal, but it should be reduced. It shouldn't hurt. You should have reasonable motion. So thirty four out of the thirty six had a good reduction, but fifteen X on thirteen good, seven fair. Um, and this is the, I think the numbers that Emil showed. So flexion extension, reasonable 110, pronal supination 130, but eight, eight complications, two synostosis, one instability. So they do well if you fix it systematically, but, um, not, not normal. All right. I have a few minutes. I want to touch on a different case. So similar to Emil. So this, you know, the, I showed you big, big bones, big fractures, with big instability, but those are kind of easier to fix. These little pieces, you know, make me worry and cause problems. So this, uh, this is a classic ATV. Uh, it was sent from another ER. They said it was reduced, and they had some bone chips in the in the joint. So not reduced, right? So little pieces, and you can see this looks like a radial head piece. This looks like a coronoid piece. Young guy, you need to reduce this. So CT helps us. So it's perch, really. It's a perch dislocation, and this shows you that you know coronoid. It's not a big piece, but it's pretty big, and the coronoid's flat like the electron. And here's our coronoid up here. So I think really that needs to be fixed. So posterior extensile approach, uh, bring the ulnar nerve up, and you can take the flexor pronator mass off and get in there. You know, know where the MCL is. The MCL is back here, and this is the coronoid. So I was able to fix the coronoid, and it's bigger than you think. And even if it's you know, a seven millimeter piece, if you can get two screws down on it, it really gives you the anterior buttress. This is the lateral side radial head, a little depression, but stability. And I think he's reduced. And you see how these screws are, you know, these are really medial to lateral, but good fixation. Tried to, I think I cut the cortex on the posterior all on one And evaluate the collateral ligaments. And I'm on the medial side, so I'm looking at them. Uh, and you never know, right? The LCL was torn off proximally. The MCL was torn off distally, which is a little unusual. But I put those down. He's reduced. And again, you know, rotate. What I do is rotate them at 90 and let them rotate. And he's got both ligaments out. So it really, you know, I don't want to super. If it's the LCL, I'll let them, uh, I'll let them pronate more because that'll stabilize it. But if it's both, I'll do 45, 45, limit that, and then avoid terminal extension for a while. Um, but, you know, get them moving. And flexion is key, right? That they get to their mouth, they get to their hair, women get to their earrings and things like that. So that's important. So in conclusion, the terrible triad, you know, they're they're challenging and they're still terrible, but I think we've learned a lot on how to fix them. They must be reconstructed anatomically and you got one shot really to fix them. So fix everything in a systematic fashion and you really have to build from deep to superficial. So if your radial head's out, then you can actually access the coronoid and hold it down and come from the back. Um, but you have to build from deep to superficial and oftentimes put all your sutures in and get ready when you reduce it, then tie everything down so you don't close the door. And if this is done, results can be acceptable. Uh, that's that's it. Thanks much. Thank you. I guess we can go to the next to our faculty, Dr. Cassidy. So if you... Thank you. Uh, thanks to the participants. Uh, for joining us tonight and 
If you have any questions, feel free to submit them into the Q and A. Uh, we have a great turnout tonight. So we'll talk a little bit about a couple of controversial subjects and a couple of uh, tips. Uh, so uh, both Emil and, and John alluded to uh, repair the coronoid. Does the coronoid always need to be fixed? Uh, and this is a study uh, with uh, 14 patients uh, where the radial head was repaired or replaced in a lateral collateral ligament repair, no coronoids fixed, and they did quite well. Uh, so this is Dean Satirianos. I think you have to be pretty selective. Uh, uh, this is a study by Dave Ring and associates with kind of a heat map of a large series of terrible triad uh, uh, fractured dislocations. And you can see that these are type one or type two uh, coronoid fractures in general and type one tip fractures don't uh, necessarily need to be fixed. The paradox is it's easier to fix them uh, before you uh, fix or replace the radial head. So, so you sort of have to make that decision uh, in advance unless you go immediately. Here's one that's a little bit even more controversial. Do we even need to operate at all? And here are two papers that looked at uh, selective treatment uh, of uh, terrible triads non-operatively. Uh, and from this, we garnered uh, prerequisites. So prerequisites, a concentric joint reduction, no mechanical block to forearm rotation, a type 1 or type 2 coronoid fracture, and a stable arc of motion, meaning that it didn't subluxate until the elbow was uh, less than 30 degrees from full ex extension. So within 30 degrees of full extension. Up in the flexion area, if it were concentric, didn't seem to subluxate, they could potentially do well. Uh, I would. The caveat is that you'd need to follow these patients very closely, and it's hard to sometimes to tell in a splint whether the elbow is really reduced or not. Uh, but for patients with significant uh, comorbidities and a small coronoid fracture, you may elect to uh, treat them non-operatively. Uh, let's take a look at this patient, 55-year-old grandmother who uh, was trying out her uh, grandson's hoverboard, had this uh, elbow dislocation, and you can see some fragments, one in the front and one in the back. Uh, this is the post-production x-ray. Uh, it looks concentric on the AP view. Uh, on the lateral view, it looks reduced. Uh, you can see the coronoid proximally, some uh, fragmentation of the radial head. But if you look, you know, the, what we learned about pediatric orthopedics, you know, the radius needs to line up with the capitalum. It's posterior. And no, uh, 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 no question about it, it was unstable. It re-dislocated in CT. So that uh, that was the test that failed. At 90 degrees of flexion, it was unstable. So that needed to be fixed. Uh, and here's that patient. Uh, so this is a lateral approach. I think a coker approach is okay in a fractured dislocation because the lateral collateral ligament is virtually always avulsed from the lateral epicondyle. And so you're really getting right into it. You you can just retract it without, uh, without uh, dividing it. It's already torn. And here from the lateral approach, you see the bald lateral epicondyle. You see the radial head fracture, and it's a shearing injury. As you can see, as the elbow is dislocating, the capitellum knocks off the anterior part of the radial head. And in this instance, the radial head was fragmented. And I agree with John, and a young patient, especially a teenager, I would put those pieces back together again. Uh, but the key is that the radial head is really needs to be stable immediately postoperatively because it's a buttress preventing resubluxation. If if it, you have inadequate fixation, that's at risk of redislocating. So that's where a radial head replacement is a stable uh, spacer. It's not really a you know arthroplasty, so to speak. But here with the radial head resected, we have good access to the coronoid. And you can see, and it's, it parallels this illustration from AO, uh, uh, where we uh, drilled from the dorsal cortex uh, of the ulna into the bed of the fracture of the coronoid. And as Emil demonstrated, you can use an ACL guide or you could do it freehand. If it's a small fragment, it's important to have those uh, drill holes be closer to the articular surface. So it's more like uh, you would think of like a, uh, a fracture dislocation of the shoulder. Uh, and so you want to have the repair close to the articular surface to help to prevent it from re-dislocating. So like a bank heart lesion. Uh, one difference for me is I'd use a running locking stitch uh, rather than this grasping stitch because I don't want to compress the capsule. I think you can over tighten it and cause a contracture. So we don't want to do that. But here we have these uh, sutures passed, heavy suture uh, through the bone and either looped around or through the coronoid. Uh, with respect to the radial head, as John mentioned, the radial head is not round. It's elliptical. 
and it's very easy to overstuff it. So we want to have the implant diameter be at least two millimeters smaller than the minor diameter of the radial head because it is canted and you can have a cam effect uh, with this naturally if you use a 90 degree stem uh, and it gets worse if the head is too big. So here if we're at 26, I go to 24. Uh, and then the height, again, it's easy to overstuff it, especially with these because the elbow is easy to thrust into varus and it looks like the gap is bigger than it really is. So you have to make sure that the joint's reduced if you're looking at the gap in the elbow. But for me, the thickness of the radial head is uh, based on four factors. The thickness, the thickest part of the excised head plus the additional resection to square it off. So that's the simplest thing to me. If you can figure that out, then you know exactly what the height should be. Uh, the pull push test or ulnar variance, that's if you if there's some axial instability or longitudinal instability. Uh, you want to make sure that the that you have the length appropriate uh, when you're putting the head in. You can use it in, with respect to the coronoid. If you look inside, it should be at about the level of the coronoid. Uh, but again, the joint must be reduced. And so here's an example, something with a collar. You have to account for the collar uh, with the thickness of the head. Uh, here's that patient with radial head uh, in place, and we're repairing the lateral ligament. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, it, you can repair it with suture anchors. I like to use uh, bone tunnels uh, with these uh, big Keith needles. The repair laterally has to be secure. This is a big part of it. You know, we, uh, Emil talked about it. the injury starts from the lateral side. You want to have that lateral structure be securely repaired. Uh, and so here we repaired the coronoid. It, we all, I also used a uh, cannulated screw. The, the, the fragment has to be big enough to accommodate that. You don't want to uh, crush it or uh, comminute it. Replace the radial head and repair the lateral ligament. Here I, I used a, a post because the bone was a little bit soft, but uh, more recently I've just been using a washer, essentially a two-hole uh, plate you could use or a button uh, to keep the, uh, the suture from cutting through the posterior aspect of the lateral column. Uh, so here is that technique. So we've I, I use a running locking suture and then two, this so the hands up to the ceiling. This is a right elbow. Uh, two divergent Keith needles. They the start point is the attachment of the lateral ligament, so it should be at the isometric point. Exit in a divergent fashion posterior. They go right through the skin, so you don't have to worry about bending around a corner. And here is the key. It's a nerve hook. So you pass those heavy sutures uh, through the, these bone tunnels with the Keith needles. And, and rather than bending, what you do is you take the nerve hook and loop the nerve hook around the Keith needle before you pull it out because you can feel the metal on metal. And then I'll show you. Uh, and then once the needle's through, you can just pull the stitch out just like that and do it for both of them. And you don't have to do any contortions or anything to get the st stitches and then I tie it like this. So you want to pronate it. Make sure the elbow is reduced. Okay. If it's isometric, uh, it's okay if you tie it in 90 degrees of flexion. But I want to make sure the elbow is reduced. It's in pronation. Uh, and then make sure it's tied securely over the posterior aspect of the lateral column. I really like that. I think it's very strong. Uh, we talked about the medial approach to the coronary. This is for, you know, these bigger fractures. Uh, you can either go through sort of like a Tommy John approach just above the FCU, or you could go through the cubital tunnel, or you could take the whole flexor pronate or origin off like John demonstrated. So here we'll go through the cubital tunnel. We've released the ulnar nerve. Make sure you don't put any tension on the ulnar nerve. And then peel the FCU up, and that, that shiny white is the uh, medial collateral ligament. As we go more distally, uh, the brachialis inserts in the anterior medial downslope of the coronoid. So if you're putting a plate on, you will encounter the, the brachialis. You have to uh, move it aside or release a few of the fibers uh, to get uh, further down. And then here it is right there. And then now we have the access to the coronoid. And that's really good for, for example, a posteromedial uh, type pattern where you want to put a plate uh, more on the medial side less so on the anterior, but you can get to both as uh, John showed er, earlier. So here's an example of a plate uh, that wraps around the uh, anteromedial side, get the top and the medial side. And then finally, we'll talk about this. This is a pretty cool technique that I learned from Dr. Jupiter. 
which is uh, using the uh, tip of the olecranon as a uh, graft for a uh, comminuted coronoid fracture. So here's a patient with a uh, elbow fracture dislocation. Post-reduction, uh, I like this image because the quality is not good, but you can see on the left-hand side that there's overlap between the ulna and the humerus, which means that it's not reduced. And then on the lateral view, you can see there's a gap. So the gap could be due to a sag or it could be due to something interposed. And uh, in this instance, uh, it's important to get a CT scan and the CT scan shows that the coronoid is stuck. It's incarcerated in the ulnar humeral joint and it's actually comminuted um, right there. And so the technique involves removing that tip of the uh, olecranon, preserving the triceps, some of the medial tricep you might have to take off. It may insert there, but the long and lateral head tendons you leave intact and then transplant it anteriorly. It's analogous to a hemihamate in that you have to think about the arc. Uh, and so where the cut is. So ideally, this is actually from Graham King's work. Uh, 50 degrees is pretty steep. But if it's too shallow, what's going to happen is you'll have sort of like a biconcave surface. Uh, which is not going to restore that buttress. So it has to be pretty steep. And if it's it like fit, like it shows here, 50 degrees will get you enough bone also to put a screw through and a plate. Thank you. That was great, uh, Dr. Cassidy. It was uh, amazing. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I think um, uh, we will go to our uh, uh, therapy session for with, with Joey Pipicelli to uh, see what to do after and then we'll ask some there's some questions I will ask uh, after the presentation so after we've done all this stuff we need to rehabilitate so here it is Joey you take over okay everyone can see my screen there yes yeah so let's just dive right into rehab um, so it's a pleasure to be here now, we're all familiar with the fortress uh, concept described by Sean O'Driscoll. Now, the therapist uh, must understand how to repair or how to um, protect repaired ligamentous and bony structures, as well as the effect of gravity uh, in order to implement early motion. Now, the muscles which cross the elbow provide us with some dynamic stability and they help to protect our uh, primary constraints. And so our elbow flexors and extensors, really, they provide minimal varus and valgus support, but they do help with maintaining ulnohumeral stability. And our flexor pronator muscles originate proximal to the ulnohumeral joint, and consequently, they're going to provide a compressive load through the medial side. So in the event of an MCL deficiency, the forearm should be positioned in supination because this is going to pivot the forearm around the lateral structures, which is going to tension the flexor pronator group of muscles, which is going to increase the compressive loads going through the ulnohumeral joint, which is ultimately going to enhance medial sided stability. And our extensor supinator group of muscles originate from the lateral epicondyle. And in the presence of an LCL deficiency, the forearm should be positioned in pronation because, it's again, it's going to increase our compressive forces going through the radial capitellar joint, which is going to enhance lateral sided stability. So here's a cadaver dissection in which uh, the LCL was uh, sectioned off uh, from the lateral epicondyle. And so we've lost one of our uh, primary stabilizers. And you can see with supination that the ulnohumeral complex rolls off, demonstrating a PLRI. But in pronation, uh, the radial head stays in, and it tracks nicely against the capitellum with flexion and extension. So prior to implementing a rehab program, the therapists need uh, to make themselves aware of the mechanism of injury and the various structures involved. So most of these cases uh, un um, undergo an operation. Therefore, we need to know the status of the skeletal and ligamentous fixation. So was it rigid or was it tenuous? And what's the status with the triceps, especially with transalecranon injuries? Was it spared or was it reflected? And what about the ulnar nerve? Was it transposed? So this information is going to allow us to establish the permissible arc of ulnohumeral motion, as well as to ensure optimal positioning within our post-operative braces. But oftentimes, referrals uh, to therapists often forget to mention the presence of a radiographic drop sign. So this is a measurable increase in ulnohumeral joint distance, which is evident on the lateral. And our typical distance is 2 to 3 millimeters, and a positive sign is anything greater than 4. 
So this can be present after both simple and complex dislocations managed with or without surgery, and it indicates that there's a persistent elbow instability. So this animation demonstrates that if the ulnohumeral joint is sagging, the ulna is going to impinge posteriorly with extension, then the coronoid is going to impinge uh, um, into the trochlea with flexion. So this is going to increase the patient's pain, their inflammation, and it's going to lead to early joint wear if it's not managed appropriately. So after the therapist gathers all that information, it's going to allow for the entire team to create a custom-tailored rehab program, which should really be based on the stages of wound healing. So the goals of phase one are to protect the healing structures while we initiate early motion. So we advocate that patients are sent to therapy within the first five days post-operatively. We're going to place them in a, in a, in a posterior splint, and the elbow is going to be at 90, and the forearm position is going to be dependent on the status of the ligaments. So in the presence of an LCL repair with an intact MCL, the forearm should be positioned in pronation in order to protect the lateral ligament. Now, in cases where um, the LCL repair is robust, but the integrity of the MCL is in question, so say it was left unrepaired or it demonstrated instability intraoperatively, then full supination should be considered in order to protect the medial side, giving it a chance to tighten up. And if the LCL repair was tenuous and the MCL is off, the forearm should be in neutral in order to protect both sides. So, some surgeons prefer to use the hinge brace, and I see I saw that in the Q and A. Uh, and again, that's primarily I think to to make um, everyone feel better because it can block extension to the surgeon's specifications. But the work of Lee and Monaka really demonstrate that hinge braces don't offer too much mechanical uh, stability. It's difficult to get the hinges uh, to sit right at the axis of the elbow. Uh, the brace adds a little bit of weight. And then you combine that with gravity and a big swollen elbow, uh, and especially if they have a drop sign, that's going to increase the joint sagging. So we prefer to place patients in the lightest splint as possible and then initiate early motion. So our preference is to um, perform overhead exercise because this is going to reduce the gravitational forces acting to distract the ulnohumeral joint, and it's going to optimize joint tracking. Now, forearm rotation, as was discussed earlier, uh, should be performed with the elbow at 90 degrees of flexion, and it can be performed in overhead or at the patient's side, but it should be in uh, in flexion as best they can. Now, we advocate that patients perform these exercises on an hourly basis uh, for between 10 and 20 repetitions. Now, uh, in order to demonstrate the importance of overhead exercise, here's a case of a 54-year-old male who sustained a terrible triad. These are his post-op day five radiographs, and he had a type 1 coronoid uh, radiohead arthroplasty and an LCL repair. So uh, the radiograph here on the left is with the arm in your traditional at-the-side position, and then we x-rayed him in the uh, overhead position. And then it, um, you can see that he had a drop sign, and it's much improved in overhead. And then we had him uh, flex in the traditional dependent position, and again in overhead, and we can see that the sagging improves uh, with overhead. So if we're not performing motion in the overhead position, this can cause hinging of the coronoid into the articular cartilage, uh, which can again compromise fracture healing. And as you can see in this set of extension x-rays, well, the elbow is much more stable in overhead because gravity is helping to uh, keep the elbow reduced. Now, with drop signs, we should also have patients perform isometric contractions of their triceps, biceps, and brachialis. Uh, so this is a, a neat um, uh, video from one of my colleagues. Um, after trauma, really, uh, our, our muscles forget how to fire appropriately because there can be a, a bit of a cortical misrepresentation. And having them perform in intermittent isometrics helps to retrain these muscles to fire more efficiently and appropriately, which is essentially going to suction cup the joint back up, which is going to uh, improve the joint sagging. Now, drop signs typically resolve spontaneously somewhere in the first six weeks, and once correction is observed radiographically, then we can progress patients to active motion in all planes. So if we move on to the second phase of rehab, here patients are typically much more comfortable, but it's important that we keep in mind that the tensile strength of the healing structures are low. 
So once the surgeons are happy with the osseous and ligamentous healing, which is typically around six weeks, that's when we can discharge their protective splints. Uh, we use a lot of heat and therapy in order to try to precondition the tissues and and um, uh, to make them uh, feel a little looser and then to stretch them out. And if end range stretching is desired, we can um, apply some heat with a light weight and keep them that way uh, for a few minutes in order to increase tissue extensibility. Gentle passive motion in all planes typically begins at six weeks and it's going to extend well into the remodeling phases, but it's important to remember that stretching should be uncomfortable but never painful. So if we move on to phase three, really here the goals are to maximize motion, strength, and function. Uh, here, um, passive and active motion continue, but this is when, when we can typically start implementing static progressive splinting in order to maximize their motion. Strengthening of our dynamic stabilizers is important and includes our uh, wrist muscles, our digital flexors and extensors, as well as we should uh, begin inline strengthening of our forearm rotators and our elbow flexors, but really emphasis should be placed on our uh, triceps in order to maximize extension. Now, despite our best efforts, uh, stiffness can persist, which can often be a lengthy and even costly challenge for our patients. And the mainstay of treatment really is mobilization splinting, but their use should be based on the tissue's end feel, so either springy or soft. And it should really follow the principles of low load prolonged stretch because we need to avoid an inflammatory reaction. And we should, um, therapists should really implement the total end range time principle or TERT, which looks at the um, relationship between the time a stiff joint is positioned at their end range and the overall improvement in passive motion. So this TERT principle is critical because we need to identify how much time a joint needs to be stretched in order to make lasting tissue changes. Now, flexion contractures are predictable. And we should probably consider using night extension splints as early as four weeks postoperatively. Now, these would be reserved for patients who are having a hard time gaining extension. So at four weeks, they're at 50 or 60 degrees of, of, of extension. And it's important to remember that these devices don't apply any overpressure. They simply help to maintain their daytime extension achievements, which are made with frequent exercises. And in our practice, using early extension splinting often prevents the need for static progressive devices, but the therapist always needs to have this discussion with the surgeon, especially with uh, tenuous coronoid fixations. Now, if night splinting produces minimal improvement and um, everyone is pleased with osseous and soft tissue healing, then a static progressive turnbuckle splint can be fabricated, but the wearing schedule really should be patient specific. But generally, they're worn for 30 to 60 minutes, three or four times a day, and then they continue with their static night splints. Now, uh, therapists love to make hinged braces uh, that look like this. Uh, they're cheaper than uh, some of our commercially available devices, and they are effective um, uh, with uh, flexion contractures of greater than 30 degrees to provide a, 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 a sufficient rotational force to stretch out the tissues with minimal compression going through the joint. But when you get to uh, um, contractures that are 30 degrees or less, then we need a, a some type of three-point extension splint because this is going to maximize rotation and, and minimize compression going through the joint. And this is just something simply we can do as therapists is just to crisscross our straps over the electronon to create this three-point extension uh, uh, system. Now, there are, there's uh, numerous splint designs for... Um, to regain flexion, but there's no randomized control trials indicating which one is superior. But there is a biomechanical analysis which provides us some evidence that hinges should really be used with elbows that have less than 110 degrees of flexion uh, in order to absorb the compressive loads that are going to go through the joint. And as the flexion angle improves, then um, uh, the devices are going to need to be modified in order to optimize the rotational force. But once these elbows can get past 110 degrees of flexion, we don't need a, um, um, any type of hinge because the compressive load going through the joint is low and the rotational force is going to be high. So this image here on the right is of a flexion cuff, which is a very simple and uh, frankly, a, a cheap device that we can provide patients, which is effective at end, uh, especially at end range flexion. 
Now, forearm rotation contractures are also common, and at our facility, we uh, typically employ uh, dynamic splints because they're fairly easy to fabricate and relatively cost-effective. But if they're making minimal improvements, we'll transition to a commercially available device. Um, I think these jazz pronation supination devices are the are the best braces on the market for terminal rotation. And again, I have no conflicts of interest with them. But the take-home message really is uh, that the key to success to optimize outcomes is close communication between the surgeon and the therapist, which is going to allow for careful treatment planning. Um, so if you'd like to discuss, my email is there. And it was a pleasure to be part of the panel. That was a great presentation, Joey. I was uh, enjoyed it. It was very nice and addressed a lot of stuff that the uh, questions that came up on the uh, question and answer uh, box. Uh, this is a good time to uh, have all of our uh, presenters uh, on the uh, on the camera, and we can enjoy, uh, discuss some of the questions can come up with this case. Well, uh, one question I have for Dr. Capo about the uh, the actual doing the case. Let's say you uh, this is a situation that I have been in, and I had to decide what to do. So the classic terrible triad: I go in there and fix the radial head and do the uh, anterior um, part of the capsule and the uh, coronoid, and I fix the lateral and lateral ligament, and I examine the patient, and the, the, lo and behold, the cup about, about 30 degrees, after 30 degrees, tends to dislocate again. I was like, huh, what to do? Now, classically, you would say, okay, 30 degrees is enough. Let's keep him in a splint for 30 degrees. And some people would say, no, this is the time to go medial and look on the medial side, see what's going on and maybe repair medial coronal ligament. What's your input on that? <clears throat> so in 30 degrees of extension, it's popping out? Yeah. Yeah. So something's, you know, something's giving way <clears throat> uh, to go posterior. So, you know, the MCL could always look there, but the MCL shouldn't cause a dislocation if it's out. You know, it would cause, yeah. you know, valgus instability. So, yeah, you can go over there, tighten it, but it it's probably... You know, it's probably your coronoid's not stable enough, you know, and, and it's crumbly, so you can't stabilize it. Yeah. So I think that's, yeah, that's when you, um, that's when you need a hinged X fix, you know, either, an, you know, an internal joint, sorry, in, yeah. internal joint stabilizer, or even, you know, even, sorry, you know, even a fixed X fix to hold it, but, you know, a hinge. Sure. So sometimes for some reason, it pops out in the 30s, you know, 30s a tweener, as we say, you know, you could hold them, you know, if they at 90, if they're in, you can hold them. You don't need the, the hinge yeah. and then flex them and gradually bring it out. You know, it depends on the reliability to be safe. I would, um, I'd put a, you know, internal and, uh, yeah. IJS on them. Chuck, what do you think? What's your experience? Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting one because the patient's asleep. So there's no muscle tone. Yeah. Um, one thing I would think about is, is, is there something you're deposed? So we always, if we're take, doing a radial head replacement, we want to account for every single fragment of the radial head. There could be something stuck in there. Uh, the, the third is, you know, we know if it's not a perch dislocation, but a complete dislocation, that the medial collateral ligament is out. And that's the last in our algorithm in terms of repairing. If you have a really bad injury, you could avulse your flexor pronator mass, and that could make it really much more unstable. Uh, but the other thing to think about, and, I, and I've had this experience myself, is, you know, we're taught that if, for lateral sided injuries or like, like even a PD supracondylar fracture, if you pronate it, you help to reduce it, right? But if if you fix the lateral side and then pronate it, it's imbalanced because the lateral side has been fixed. The medial side's not been fixed. If you pronate it, it's actually going to gap in the only humeral joint. It's going to line up in the radiocapitellar joint. And if you extend it, it's going to potentially dislocate this. So what I would what, what I would do in that instance is I would supinate it first. First, it's probably too late to know. You're not going to go back in and look for fragments of bone at that point. Hopefully you've washed yeah. it out. And that's not a problem. But I would supinate it and try the same thing. You know, without the ligament intact or repaired, it's going to pop out. But with it repaired, it may be more stable actually in supination. So I would I would test that and see if it's if it's a little more stable. It sounds kind of ironic, but that's it. And then I would just, you know, splint them at 90. And uh, like Joey mentioned, you don't want to wait too long before you have them start moving it. Um, 
Sure. Definitely, you know, definitely less than two weeks, you want to have them start moving it. So I typically have them come back, you know, at the end of the week or the beginning of the following week and have them start moving it. Yeah. And, and the overhead protocol is really critical. If you have a little sag on, on the, you know, your reduction, the overhead protocol reduces them. And I've even had patients, I get an x-ray and they're sagging a little bit uh, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll, I'll lay them down and push it down and, you know, re-splint it. But that the gravity really reduces it. So you can flex it uh, and the gravity will keep reducing the elbow um, if you have a little subluxation. So, Joey, there was a the same question. If if I have this same patient that I cannot go past 30 degrees and I send a, a request for the therapy to watch out for how do you prevent any accidental extension and to do the therapy? Well, for us, we would we would just have them move exclusively in extension because we and because we know gravity is going to help keep that reduced, but then we will just stop them at at 40 and just don't let them go past that because it's better to have a stiff joint than 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 a loose one. Um, and then obviously that you need to really educate them to be compliant that they shouldn't be cheating, taking that off and, and letting it fall out. So do you use a uh, like a hinge brace with a stop at uh, 40? Uh, well, no, because we just find that it, it it doesn't fit most patients. The elbow's swollen and the hinge never sits right at the access and it tends to slip, especially while they're sleeping. And uh, so we, 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 we prefer not to use them um, in, in those situations. I see. Now, as far as the, you know, one challenge with the therapy is that when the patient comes in here and you're working hard to get extension, and we put them on these braces and all that stuff, and then they tend to lose flexion. So then you start working on the flexion, and then they lose extension. So how do you balance the flexion and extension part of this? Well, um, I mean, we know just through daily activities that they're going to use their flexors much more than their extensors. And so, uh, but flexion is much more important than extension. Yeah. So we try to emphasize early uh, extension in terms of um, use of night extension splints. But if that's limiting them too much, then we'll just stop using extension splints until they gain a little bit of extension for two or three weeks. And then we'll start implementing again their, their nighttime extension splints and uh, just have them using more um, and more frequent daily use to, to regain their flexion. But it is it is a battle. We're always walking a tightrope because we know they're going to develop a flexion contracture. That's predictable, but we don't want to over-treat that and, and then delay their function. So, And then at the same time, uh, when you're using that uh, static progressive splint, we know that these patients never, almost never get full extension. So when you call it quits, when you say enough is enough and enough, you know, you've got a whole year, two years, I mean, how long do you work on this? Uh, well, I mean, we know from the literature that their extension can improve for up to a, up to a year with, with those devices. Hopefully we don't need it for that long. Yeah. Um, once the goal should really be five degrees of improvement every week or two. And then if they've done three, or four weeks and they haven't maximum and there's been no improvement in extension then and it's been five or six months and they're sitting at you know 35 30 25 degrees that's when we would call it call it quits uh i think it's important because um we know that those extension splints at night are poorly tolerated you, you know it's hard to sleep in them and and uh but i find that if the, the more OCD our patients are, um, then they typically don't lose any of their extension gains. Because, you know, once they stop with splinting, they find they lose about five or 10 or 10 degrees of their extension. So I think if they're diligent with their nightwear, even if it's just for a few hours and then they wake it up and take it off, I think that can maximize their extension. There was one uh, question that it was sent for everybody is like, how uh, do we approach uh, uh, HO prophylaxis? I personally don't actually use any prophylaxis unless it's a uh, revision or a takedown of the uh, of synostosis, but I don't know what the panel thinks. I agree with you uh, in the acute setting. There's sort of a related one that is steroids. Uh, there there was a paper on, um, yes. on ster perioperative steroids uh, reducing inflammation, maybe have better range of motion, maybe less HO. I don't do it routinely, but... You know, we could. Our total joint people use it steroids all the time, uh, which is kind of ironic. But so, 
that is an option, but I, I don't do prophylaxis acutely. I mean, for acute fractures. Sure. John? Yeah, I, I agree. The only time I would think about it is if there's really no bone to heal and somebody had a head injury or something, like a radial head replacement, ligamentous repair. So I'm not worried about the non-union because that's what we're worried about. And, you know, we, we've seen that. So no bony, you know, um, bo no bony injuries that need to heal. And somebody's a setup for a for HO, head injury, ICU, things like that. So that's the only time I think about it. But just generally um, in releases and uh, HO resection for secondary operations. Interestingly enough, I saw an article about uh, giving patients uh, TXA, transaminic acid, to uh, improve their motion and decrease chance of HO. Or, because we do it in the shoulders, we do it in the around the hips, but this is an interesting concept. Yeah, I, I used it with an elbow release today, contraction oh. release today. All right. Um, yeah, I'm, back to Joey for a minute. I, there are a couple of comments. That, one is a quote. I love this quote from Hotchkiss, and that is, don't work on real estate you already own. So it's easy for patients to get what they absolutely need, but the rest is difficult. And, you know, the, I think patients tend to rely on the therapist that, hey, can you make my arm move better? <laughs> Uh, and the reality is, you know, the patients have to really be committed to get the rest. And the re like you said, that it's very infrequent that you need to extend your elbow fully. And yet patients go crazy about the fact that they can't straighten their elbow all the way. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I was I spent some time at the Mayo Clinic af uh, after my fellowship uh, with uh, Dr. Mori, one of my also mentors and idols. And he had his patients wear braces 23 hours a day. That's what he told them. Elbow flexion split, extension flint, splint, flexion split. You get an hour off to shower and move it. Uh, I don't know how compliant the patients were, but the point was, you know, when you look at, and Joey is a big fan of static progressive, which I am as well, but like, for example, the JS company says 30 minutes a day is all you need. And I think it's really kind of a, a joke, to be honest with you. I think you got to do what he said and, uh, you know, several times during the day or a continuous period, not to over tighten it. That's for sure. Like, like Joey said that, you know, you could cause inflammation, but it's, it's like creep, you know, it's, it's not going to happen right away, but it requires time. Yeah. Good point. And, and a static progressive splint is really critical, right? The ones that Joey was showing <clears throat> and those help. And, you know, it, it takes a good therapist like Joey to make those things. Right. So I always worry if my patients go to therapy for some reason somewhere else and the therapist says, oh, we have to order that $3,000 splint and it's a dynamic off the shelf splint, it's just not the same. So, a, a, you know, a well-built static progressive splint is really critical. And like you're saying, Chuck, you know, it's that little creep that, you know, I think that wears them down and pulls on it. So that's, you know, really important. Well, one other thing, John, actually you mentioned when you put the plate on the radial head that frequently you have to go take it out. I'll be interested to see your steps of how, uh, other than just taking the plate out, what are your steps of releasing? Because it's very hard to get pronation, supination back. Yeah. But it's just a simple removal of hardware. There's some there's some issue with the contracture, the interosseous ligament. There are other problems with the whole uh, you know, proximal radial ulnar joint. So, how do you? What What's your steps? You yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, that, that's a good point. You know, if there's not, you know, if the main reason we take out the plate is for contraction, because the plate usually doesn't bug people sure. um, a little bit. But if it's if there's no synostosis, you can. I've had good results of just going around the radial head taking out the plate and releasing, releasing, you know, reaching over on the ulnar side, releasing and going distal and no, you know, no interosseous membrane, nothing crazy. And I always tell them, I don't know, you know, if you're going to get a good release, but they usually get significant improvement. And I make sure I get an x-ray of the forearm. There's nothing distally. There's nothing in the shaft. And it's a lot of, you know, manipulation, manipulation, stretching, stretching. And usually you can get them, to like 60, 60, and they're much happier. And they usually keep it. And the only thing is you're leaning on the LCL, right? You got your retractor back there and you're trying not to pull on. So at the end, it might be a little loose. You might have to pull, put it back down. You know, you don't have to take it down, but if you stretch it a little bit, tighten it back up at the end. Excellent. All right, we're discussing titanium, you know, versus stainless steel. So titanium is bi biocompatible. The modules of elasticity is great, but it can cause a reaction. And so you can get like tissue adherence to the plate. 
which can re uh, result in some loss of motion, um, even if the plate's properly placed. Um, so that's where, you know, a release, just removing the plate could could help. Uh, but at least theoretically, you know, the plate itself shouldn't block too much, but it can, especially if it gets stuck. Yeah. And if you, you know, if you can, like Emil showed, if you can just do cross screws, those usually don't, you know, that's, that's the more lower profile usually doesn't impinge. So um, even the case I showed, you could do cross screws and, you know, catch that far, far cortex and it's pretty stable and less prominent. Yeah. Those are hard to do. Not easy. <laughs> just, they, you're blind. You don't know where it's ending out and, and, and it's hard to uh, measure all that screw, screw length to get bite, good bite. But it works if you get a nice tripod, three three screws that can be useful. Well, if there's no other questions or no comments, uh, it's already five sixteen. We're one minute past our a lot of time. I uh, appreciate everybody's uh, comments and inputs and present excellent presentation for all. And uh, hope everybody whose audience will uh, tune in for our next uh, online series and take a look at the rest of our webinars that we have on store for you for AO North America. And uh, that will be the end of our course. If there's no other comments, we'll conclude. Awesome. Thanks, Emil. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.